I must issue a disclaimer right at the beginning. I am certainly not a refugee lawyer, so this is not going to be a lecture on the finer points of refugee law. Um, but I think I do bring a perspective, particularly of the region, um, and sort of looking at Australia's policies in terms of the impact it has for our relationships, particularly with other countries. And so that's really what I want to, to talk about today. But, I mean, I've been sitting up here and I noticed some of you are looking a little bit tired. So before I start my proper presentation and bore you all to death, maybe I'll start just with a little story. So imagine a family, a mother and a father, let's call them David and Catherine. David, or Dave, um, is a primary school teacher. He teaches grade five. And Catherine, she works for a bank. They have a 10-year-old daughter, Emily, and she loves horses. And a five-year-old son, Paul, who's crazy about Spider-Man. Now imagine that Dave, Catherine, Paul, and Emily have gone out for the day. They come back home to their house, and their neighbor's house has been burnt down in an arson attack. And a note has been pinned to their door saying, you're next, Christian scum. Because Dave, Catherine, Paul and Emily don't live in Australia. They live in Pakistan, where every day their lives are threatened by violent militants who are trying to drive out minorities. They can't rely on the police to protect them. Neighbouring Afghanistan isn't secure, so that isn't a safe route for them to go to. India obviously doesn't welcome people from Pakistan. They can't just jump on a plane to a safe country because they don't have passports and they don't have visas. They can't go to the embassy, the Australian embassy, the UK embassy. They can't even get to that district of Islamabad because it's so highly fortified. So, you know, what really are, they, are their options? What really can they do? Well, really, this plight of David, uh, Catherine, Paul and Emily is really like the plight of so many desperate asylum seekers today around the world. And we have 50 million people now, according to UNHCR, who are displaced in this predicament. So all over the world, we have people who are being persecuted, thrown in prison for their beliefs, for speaking out against the government, um, who are being tortured or beaten or killed for being a minority. Some of these people have to flee their countries um, when the state can't protect them, or indeed when the state is actually part of the problem. My organization, Human Rights Watch, works on a whole range of these violations. We don't specialize um, particularly on refugees, but actually we look at a lot of the root causes and abuses from which people flee. Um, we have researchers who cover issues in 90 countries around the world, and what we do is we issue reports. We document patterns of violations. And the reason why we do that is we want to make recommendations to the government for change. We try and pick issues where we feel that they'll benefit from a bit of international attention and where we feel like this will actually make a tangible difference to people's lives on the ground. The flip side of the research that we do is advocacy, and that's actually where our office here in Australia comes in. We set up the office here last year because we felt like our headquarters are in New York, but we felt like the global balance of power is shifting. Asia is becoming a lot more important. We need to find countries in the region that can take more of a leadership role on human rights. And we felt like actually Australia is a good prospect for that. It's one of the oldest countries in the region. It has very strong, robust institutions, pretty free press, um, and it has a lot of leverage over countries because of its trade um, and military relationships with, with other countries. Of course, there's only one small problem with that, and that is Australia has huge problems with its own domestic human rights record. And so, you know, my job um, as an advocate trying to get Australia to promote human rights in its foreign policy is made more difficult when the Australian government basically just tramples over the, the letter of the conventions that it's already signed up to. So how can we expect to convince other countries um, that they should be respecting international law when it seems when it comes to refugees and asylum seekers that, you know, in fact, we're, we're no better? So, Part of the reason, we actually didn't intend to focus a lot on refugees and asylum seekers when we set up the office here. But in the past year that we've been here, I think I've been surprised on a weekly, almost daily basis um, about various new measures um, that the previous government and also that this government have introduced, which really call into question um, our adherence to international law. And I think, you know, really this is important in terms of Australia's long-term strategic interests in the region. This is not just about being a good global international player, 
But if we want um, the region, if we want to have a safe and prosperous region, which is what I've heard our foreign minister talk about, then actually we need to be strategic. We need to look at long term um, how are we going to improve the situation in other countries and not simply turn a blind eye to abuses. So today I thought I'd talk about um, a couple of main areas. I want to talk briefly about offshore processing and enhanced screening, these Orwellian terms. Um, and what they mean for, you know, whether these policies are really compliant with our international obligations. Secondly, I want to talk a bit about um, the relationships with other countries. And here I'm just going to draw a few case examples, Sri Lanka, Cambodia and Indonesia, um, and talk about what our policies mean um, for our foreign policy with, with those countries. So firstly, I thought maybe I'd start with some numbers and the question of you know, why was offshore processing reintroduced last year by the very same Prime Minister who actually had stopped offshore processing after, um, ha after the Howard regime? Well, clearly it was a, it was a political move. It came just before um, the announcement of the election. But you know, if you read the papers last year in the lead up to this, you'd quickly get the impression that we were being overrun um, by all of these boats that were coming to Australia, that so many people were coming, that something had to be done about it, um, and something had to be done quick. And I think, you know, let's, let's look at these numbers and let's look at these facts. I mean, forced displacement due to conflict, persecution and disaster is really a global problem. And the thing is that problem isn't going away. In fact, it's actually growing. So according to the UNHCR, right now we have 50 million people who are displaced. Many of those people don't ever make it to countries where they can claim asylum. And a lot of those people are quite happy to stay temporarily in neighboring countries as long as they are safe or relatively safe um, with the hope that eventually, after months or years, that they'll be able to go back. But last year, we saw um, around the world just over 600,000 people lodge asylum claims. This was actually an increase of 28% over the year before. The, the European Union um, received nearly 400,000 of those claims. So nearly 82% of all asylum claims um, happened in the EU. The US and Canada received 91,000, Australia received 24,000, or about 4% of the global. So, I mean, I think when we consider that number, yes, the number had increased dramatically compared to what it had been the year before in Australia, but really at a global level, 24,000 isn't that significant. And I mean, if you look at the situation in the world today, um, look at Syria, there seems to be no end in sight to the suffering that is going on there. 2.6 million people displaced from Syria alone. You have wars going on, Iran, um, Iran Iraq, uh, Afghanistan are falling apart, Pakistan's not far behind. You have fresh conflicts in Ukraine and Central Africa. It's a pretty bleak picture when you consider what is happening. Um, and it's not just places far away. Even if you look at Burma and the plight of the Rohingya Muslims, we've seen hundreds of thousands displaced from their homes um, due to recent sectarian violence there. I think Australia's location and its isolation has actually protected it um, in the past from major migration flows. But it was really only a matter of time before asylum seekers and migrants would try to find a way to get here. And also, it kind of makes sense. We're one of the few countries in the region that has ratified the Refugee Convention, which ostensibly means that people who are fleeing persecution would assume that they may be protected here. But unfortunately, rather than opening our doors to those who are fleeing persecution, right now Australia is closed. We are sending people who have suffered, many of whom have suffered enormous horrors, to be detained offshore in processing camps in Papua New Guinea and in Nauru where they aren't safe or secure at all. According to the government, we are doing this in order to save lives at sea. But I can tell you there are many, many ways that would be better and more effective at saving lives at sea that don't extend to putting people in horrific uh, detention conditions without any long-term safeguards or security. Right now, we have about 2,000 people who are detained on Nauru and Manus Island. Um, about 10% of those are children. There's been a very small number that have received status uh, determinations. I think now we're up to uh, 128 on Nauru. And of those, 99 have been found to be refugees. So you can see it is actually the, the vast majority. Now, you know, obviously this is a conference for lawyers, so let's talk about the legal obligations. Sending people offshore isn't illegal. And look, in some circumstances, it may actually make sense to send people offshore. 
In Europe, the EU has been considering a number of proposals in order to help um, alleviate the burden on Italy. Italy this year has received, I think in the first six months, over 65,000 migrants and asylum seekers that have come by boat to its shores. And so look, I mean, I think if Australia was trying to work out a deal with New Zealand, I don't think organisations like ours would have a problem with it. But international law requires that you have access to a fair and efficient processing system and an ability to resettle people from other countries safely and harmoniously from other citizens to provide in UN speak a durable solution. And you know, this is not really in place in Papua New Guinea or Nauru, where you have people detained in substandard conditions with few long-term prospects for resettlement. So this is what actually makes it unlawful. Both the UNHCR and Amnesty, who have visited the camps in Nauru and Manus Island, have expressed deep concern about the conditions in these camps. And the UNHCR has also talked a bit about how this is a returns-based policy. We talked a bit about that this morning, um, about making the conditions so bad in the camps that actually going home will look good. Another big part of the problem is, you know, what's happening in these camps is happening far away from the prying eyes of journalists, of human rights organisations. It's been very difficult to access these camps and get clear information about exactly what is going on. A number of UN mechanisms, special procedures, um, special rapporteurs have also made requests um, because they want to see what is going on, but they've yet to be invited by the Papua New Guinea or the Nauru government. There are a number of legal problems um, with our offshore processing. And you know, part of this is the punitive aspect of treating people who arrive by boat differently from asylum seekers who arrive by other means. But there's a few other problems as well. Papua New Guinea, you may not be aware of this, but Papua New Guinea recently brought in a local regulation which allows it to exclude refugee status from any asylum seeker who, and I'll quote, has during the period of his or her residency at the processing centre or anywhere within Papua New Guinea exhibited a demeanour incompatible with a person of good character and standing. Now, this is quite incredible. I mean, the Refugee Convention does set out conditions whereby someone can be excluded from refugee status, but that is actually reserved for people who have committed war crimes or crimes against humanity. But this is basically saying that in Papua New Guinea, if a detention guard has subjectively decided that you're not of a suitable demeanour, then basically you can be excluded from refugee status. So, you know, there are very serious concerns about the existing laws on the books in both Nauru and Papua New Guinea, um, and really, you know, whether, whether these are compliant with international law. And I think what the government has done is, it's recognised after what happened with the Malaysia solution under the previous government, where we were trying to send refugees to Malaysia. Um, this was prevented by the High Court because Malaysia hadn't signed the Refugee Convention. So the government has realised that actually what it has to do is it has to work with countries that have ratified the convention. But if you look at Papua New Guinea, it's actually got still seven reservations. They're quite serious ones about the right to work, the right to education for asylum seekers. A lot of these problems haven't been ironed out. And so I think that was the big mistake, was not in making sure that those systems were in place um, before we decided to you know, expediently send boatloads of people there. Just coming back to the issue of returns, it's not only through making the conditions unbearable um, that our government has been trying to entice people to return to their home countries. Last month it was revealed that the government has effectively started bribing people to return home and Fairfax Media reported how cash payments of in some cases $5,000 were being given to certain nationalities if they return home. These payments are even being offered to people from countries um, currently at war, countries like Iraq, countries like Syria, where you're basically bribing people to go back to a war zone. The government has not denied making these payments, um, even though they've had the opportunity to, to do so. And I think, you know, clearly this isn't an issue of whether it's lawful or not, um, but there are a lot of concerns about putting people un under certain pressure um, to make these decisions. And particularly where you've got sort of a war situation, um, you know, I can imagine if, you, if your family is back in Syria um, and you're sitting in a camp and you don't know how long you're actually going to be there and you're locked up, then probably it looks pretty good to get $5,000 to go back to get your family and get them out of there and take them to another country. 
And I think this is one of the problems of our solution, is that while it might be working well for Australia, Australia's solution is basically another country's problem. We're just pushing the burden onto other countries. So I want to talk a little bit more, I guess, in this vein of working with countries that have signed the convention. And it makes it quite difficult, actually, for our government, because in this region, not many of them have signed the Refugee Convention. So I guess that's why they looked at Cambodia, which is one of the few that has, um, as supposedly a suitable place um, to send and resettle refugees. And it's interesting, all of this information about this uh, resettlement plan with Cambodia has been coming out of the Cambodian officials. Our officials have really said very little. The only thing that our immigration minister, Scott Morrison, has said is, you know, it's not about whether they are poor, it's about whether they can be safe. And he said this, you know, really to defend the government's plan to, to send people to Cambodia. And I think we have concerns on two grounds. Firstly, Cambodia certainly is not safe for refugees. Cambodia is a country that has a track record of forcibly returning people um, who were approved by UNHCR back to their home countries. This has happened with regard to Uyghurs from China. They're a Muslim minority. We know that some of those Uyghurs who were sent back in 2009 um, subsequently were sentenced to lengthy prison terms and are now in jail in China. We know that this has also happened with regard to Khmer Krom monks from uh, Vietnam. And in order to prevent these monks from organizing and being active um, in, the com in the community in the Mekong Delta um, in, in Cambodia, um, again, there has been the threat of forced return and in some cases the refoulement um, of these monks back to Vietnam. But Cambodia also isn't safe if you're Cambodian. I mean, there are lots of issues there with regard to excessive use of force, um, particularly uh, a number of issues with security forces beating, in some cases killing detainees, long sentences of imprisonment for government critics, a whole host of problems which need to be sorted out. So, I mean, it really makes you wonder why our government thinks that Cambodia would be a suitable home um, for refugees. So these, but these are basically a long list of questions that the government has avoided answering because all of the issues around border security, around refugees and asylum seekers are deemed um, in the interests of national security and are deemed issues that um, are, are protected and they've basically decided that you know, it's better to have no, dis no public discussion of these issues um, than, than a lot of public discussion. So last month, just when I thought things couldn't get any worse, when I was reading about these cash payments being offered to people to return to Iraq in the same week that ISIS was massacring hundreds of civilians in Iraq, um, it was revealed that two Sri Lankan boats had turned up in the Indian Ocean and had been intercepted by the Australian Navy, and that the Navy was planning to return these boats uh, into the hands of the Sri Lankan authorities, hand them over to the Sri Lankan Navy. And at first, I really couldn't believe it. I thought, there's no way that the government could seriously be considering doing this. But then it happened. One of the boats, they handed them over. And that was a boat with primarily Sinhalese people, um, but four Tamils were on board. But look, I mean, Sri Lanka has a lot of human rights problems, not only for the Tamil population, but also for the Sinhalese. And these problems have, you know, are quite common knowledge. They've been raised by the Office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights, who visited Sri Lanka last year. Um, we have raised them in a number of our reports. We have raised the specific concern about failed asylum seekers returning to Sri Lanka and facing torture at the hands of the Sri Lankan authorities. And those concerns, when we raised them in the UK, actually led there to be um, a say on returns of Tamils back to Sri Lanka. However, the Australian government has completely dismissed those allegations, it seems, and has deemed that you know, it's worthwhile working with the Sri Lankan Navy um, in order to ensure that they can have their cooperation to prevent people from leaving Sri Lanka, as well as um, be involved in, in the return. What happened with the other boat, you're probably already quite familiar. But on the 8th of July, um, the High Court heard an injunction that was brought on behalf of one of the asylum seekers, and the Commonwealth has agreed not to return that boat. So right now, people for the last few weeks have been languishing on a naval vessel. We know very little about what the conditions um, are like on that boat and what is actually going to happen to them. But one of the issues was that basically there wasn't a proper process for their claims to be heard on boats. And this is because Australia engages in a process which they call enhanced screening, but I call basically fast-track deportation, which is basically a cursory interview, a series of questions um, that are taken um, in order to determine whether a person has a genuine asylum claim. And the government 
has decided to do this with people of specific nationalities who are generally considered not to be at risk. And so, I mean, that would make sense, I think, if it was people maybe coming from, I don't know, Sweden or the UK, but they're using this for people from Sri Lanka and people from Vietnam, probably two of the countries that have the worst human rights record in the whole region. So, you know, I think there are serious concerns about this process being used. There were serious concerns when they were doing it at Christmas Island. Now it's even worse because it seems like they're doing it on boat. Um, they're actually doing it by teleconference. That, they've deemed that that's the effective way of, of interviewing people. Um, the UN High Commissioner of Human Rights, uh, the UN, sorry, High Commissioner for Refugees has raised a lot of concerns about this. They have always said that it's most appropriate um, that such claims are assessed on dry land. And I think this is really because if you look at people who have experienced these long boat journeys, they're dehydrated, they're exhausted, they're traumatised, often they're quite fearful of authorities, they're really in no condition to articulate refugee claims. So I think you know, what, what happens to these people really remains to be seen. I think it's really despicable that they you know, remain in this legal limbo at the whim of our politics that have decided that you know, above all else we mustn't be seen to be weak um, against the people smugglers. Um, but I think, you know, we really need to think about, you know, what, what are we doing? What, are we, what initiatives are we, uh, what are we giving to these countries that we're working with um, in return for them accepting back our asylum seekers? And it seems to me that what we're giving is silence and acquiescence when they commit human rights violations. I mean, if you look at it with Sri Lanka, unfortunately, Australia lined up with China, Russia, Pakistan, at the Human Rights Council by saying that we didn't support an international investigation into war crimes. All the other Western countries basically expressed their support. Um, and not only Western countries, I mean, even countries like Indonesia, uh, the Philippines, India, they abstained. So they basically said, we don't take a position. Australia is not actually a member of the Human Rights Council, so we didn't have a vote, luckily. Um, but the fact that we actually put a statement out the day that the vote came down saying that we wouldn't have supported it you know, I think it, it really sends the wrong message. And I think we've decided that we're, we would rather get into bed with the likes of Rajapaksa and Hun Sen in Cambodia, that we're just basically going to hold our nose and bear whatever bad things they do, because you know, we basically have to work with whoever's in power, because we need to be able um, to address these refugee problems. And I think that's a very dangerous approach to take, um, particularly when these people are often um, the people who are responsible for human rights violations. So what would be better would be a more long-term approach, which would look at how you get these countries um, to actually stop the abuses from which people are fleeing. But it doesn't seem like our government is really very interested um, in that approach right now. Finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about Indonesia. Um, so at this point, let's go back to the story. Remember I started with the story of the family, um, David and Catherine, and then the children, Paul and Emily. So let's say that from Pakistan, they managed to get some money together, they pay someone to get fake passports to travel, and they have to go to a country that will let them in where they don't need a visa, so clearly that rules out Australia. So they decide to fly to Indonesia by Dubai, and they try to register with UNHCR. Um, their appointment date is in six months, so they basically decide, well, we're gonna wait it out. We're just gonna stay here. Initially, they're living in an apartment in Chisarua, which is in the hills near Jakarta. It's become a bit of a migrant um, enclave. But one day, the family is detained um, by police, and they don't have any money to pay a bribe, so they go to detention. What happens in detention is that Dave is separated from Catherine and the children. The conditions in the centre are really bad. It's squalid, it's overcrowded, there's not clean food and a lack of clean water. The kids aren't able to go to school, so they start acting up. Um, and two other people try to escape, two detainees try to escape, and they're caught. What happens is the guards beat those people so severely, um, burn them with cigarettes, beat them until blood comes out of their nose and their mouth, and the guards actually force the two children to watch that this is happening. One of those beaten detainees later dies. Catherine faces sexual harassment from male detainees, and basically at this point, Dave decides the family's had enough. They can't stay there. They don't want to stay there. So he bribes to pay the family to get them out of detention, and they basically pay their way, they bribe their way um, on a boat to, to get to Australia. Now, I think I don't need to tell you the rest of the story. We all know how this story ends. It's not a fairy tale. It's not going to have a happy ending. 
But I think, I mean, what else could be done? Could anything be done to stop them getting on that boat in the first place or having to make that difficult choice? And I think there are lots of ways that we could change that story. I mean, I think actually Dave and Catherine would have been quite happy to stay in Indonesia for a while if they had the right to work and if they could earn a bit of income and if their kids could have gone to school and if they hadn't have been locked up and put in detention. So why isn't it that our government isn't actually thinking about focusing its attention on the transit countries, countries like Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia? And I would be much more comfortable if we were putting taxpayer money into improving the conditions in those countries. And I think that's really where you know, the focus of a more humane policy would really need to be. Um, just, just so you know, last year we actually uh, documented, we put out a report on Indonesia and the detention of migrant and asylum seeker kids and the abuses they face. So the story that I was just telling you, I just amalgamated some of the stories of the testimonies of victims um, that we had interviewed when we conducted that research. So I think, I mean, I, I don't have much time left, but I think in terms of what we should do, maybe I can just sum up some of the things that I think would be a more um, humane approach to, to refugees and asylum seekers here. The first one is addressing the root causes from which people are fleeing. Now that doesn't mean that Australia is going to be on its own, the peacemaker and solving the wars in Syria and Afghanistan and everything. But I think, you know, certainly we, we have a lot of clout in the international community, it's just that we don't use it. Look at what's just happened this week with um, the Malaysian Airlines and the Security Council. Australia played a great role, very strategic role in pushing for that. So actually, I think if we actually also applied that approach to human rights in a number of different instances, particularly in the region, we could actually work a long way to improving the conditions in countries from which people are fleeing. And ultimately, I think this is a better approach than cuddling up to authoritarian rulers like Hun Sen and Rajapaksa. Secondly, I think we should be looking at cooperating uh, with countries from which people are fleeing and cooperating from, with the transit countries rather than engaging in unilateral actions, things like pushbacks um, with Indonesia, which are bound to just increase tensions with other countries. And in terms of these cooperations, you know, I think, as I mentioned, I think there are lots of things we could do. Obviously, it would be sort of the gold star, the gold standard, if we could get every country in the region to ratify the Refugee Convention. But I don't think it's going to happen, and I don't think Australia's advocacy is going to be very good on that, given that we are the country that has ratified the Refugee Convention, but we're clearly not living up to our international obligations. But in the meantime, what would make a real impact and change in people's lives is if they had the right to work, if their kids could go to school, if they weren't going to be you know, facing the threat of arrest and detention, and if they were detained, they, if they aren't at risk of abuses in detention. So clearly just a number of very practical things that Australia could be doing, funding shelters for children rather than detention centres in Indonesia, for instance. And finally, I just want to say, I guess, about how our policies are having serious repercussions in terms of the rest of the world. This is a global problem, and Australia is a country that has you know, significant resources. It doesn't look good when we are foisting our burden onto some of the poorest countries in the region, and we're basically just paying our ways out. If you look at the US, if you look at Europe, I mean, they're also facing these issues of a lot of you know, migrants coming across the border. You know, in many ways, we're protected because of our isolation. So I think you know, really what we would like to see is you know, instead of focusing on these sort of quick fix political solutions, really thinking that these are difficult, these are sometimes intractable um, problems, but there are you know, certain strategic long-term things that we can do together with other countries. Um, and I think you know, Australia on its own, raising its voice about these violations perhaps won't be that significant, but if we're doing it in concert with people in the international community, working together with other countries, then yes, I think you know, we can really do so. So I think I'll leave it there, and then maybe um, I can just answer any questions that people specifically have. Um, hi, it's not actually um, a question, but rather the Asylum Seeker Resource Centre um, is reporting that 
um, the asylum seekers um, on the ship uh, on their way to uh, Christmas Island and then oh. to um, the detention centre, the Curtin Detention Centre in Western Australia. So I thought people um, might like to know that. Yeah, thank you. I didn't know that. I mean, I think we try to be um, completely apolitical so that we're not too close to any political party. But let's be honest, it's the Greens that, that have been the only ones that have had you know, a, a, a very good position on these issues. Both the Liberal and the Labour Party have been as bad as each other. And I think what it is, is that we need to do is we need to find individuals in both parties. And I do think that they exist. They existed under the Howard administration too. Um, but there are people um, on both sides of the fence who do deeply disagree with what is happening. And I think we really need to work with them so that their voices um, can be heard. And that's so we really sort of try and um, you know, ostracize, I think, you know, the, the way in which this has become mainstream. But I also think we need to look at you know, what really went wrong during the years of the Rudd government. Because you know, initially, he got a lot of, you know, I, I actually wasn't living in Australia then, but I was tracking a lot of these developments from New York. And it seemed like initially he got a lot of recognition for ending the Pacific solution. Um, but then it really became about pandering to the polls rather than actually trying to influence public opinion. So I think this is deeper than just changing our politicians. We actually need to think about you know, how we can sort of um, change, I guess, the broader public perceptions in Australia. And I think part of that is through having um, more positive uh, you know, messaging around um, the benefits that you know, migration and asylum seekers and refugees bring to our communities, um, rather than, you know, reading in the tabloids all the time about all the problems um, that are being caused. And I think, yeah, I, I also am I'm surprised here at, I guess, the amount of attention that a small number of people really get um, in, in the newspapers in terms of, you know, the numbers of the votes. Because in the States, this is happening all the time. And it's just, not, it's just not a big political issue. Whereas here, it seems like it is the, the number one issue. So I certainly think you know, a lot of work needs to be done, and it, and it is going to be a slow process. It's not going to be a fast one. Hi, Elaine. Um, thanks for your talk. I wondered about um, the way that Australia engages with other states in our region. And I think a lot of the diplomacy is also couched in the terms of not wanting to cause offence or wanting to engage and not isolate the states. And obviously the relationship that we have with the countries in our region is important for a range of reasons, um, including trade, and is likely to only become more important in the so-called Asian century. So I wondered if you had any, any comments on what Australia um, what you think about this sort of engagement and not isolation approach that we have and whether or not there is any examples of how Australia has actually been outspoken on human rights issues in our region and, and that, that has had some sort of a positive effect. Yeah, I mean, I think the engage, isolate sort of debate, you know, I often say to people, you know, it's not, it's not about one or the other, actually, I think you know, you, you can engage and you can also isolate. You have to have carrots and sticks in your diplomacy with other countries. I think that's very important. Um, but I think the concern with the sort of quiet diplomacy that Australia seems to favour is we don't know exactly what is happening behind closed doors. But if publicly we see the messages, this is very important not only for people here in Australia who are monitoring what our government is doing, but also for the people of those other countries. So for people in Indonesia or for people in Vietnam, because you know, you've also got to think, I've been thinking a lot about the Vietnam-Australia Human Rights Dialogue, which is taking place actually on Monday. And you know, the Vietnam government is obviously going to spin this in its media that, you know, look at how proactive we are on human rights. We're having a dialogue with Australia. 
But if Australian officials aren't outspoken and public in their messaging, then Vietnamese people are going to think that you know, the Australian government just buys into that. So I think that's why it's very important you know, in any visit, whether it's to China or Indonesia, that there is public pressure. And public pressure is actually what makes a difference um, when it comes to human rights. And just to give a practical example of how um, I've seen that play out, uh, a few years ago, there was, I don't know if you remember this, but there was this really horrific video that went viral um, of some, it was in West Papua, it was a number of Indonesian military officers who tortured two Papuans really horrifically. And the video went viral. Initially, the Indonesian government just tried to dismiss it. They said, you know, this is fake. But there was hard evidence. And the US Secretary of State started to raise concerns about this. Julia Gillard was also visiting um, Indonesia at that time. She started to raise concerns. And, you know, it was actually quite important, I think, that um, Gillard mentioned this in her public statements, that she was concerned and that she would be monitoring the investigation. And as a result of that, there was actually a court martial and several people um, were convicted and prosecuted. I wish that they had gone to jail for a much longer time, um, but you know, at least I guess it was a starting point. I don't think that trial would have happened if the US and Australia hadn't raised their concerns publicly. I think Indonesia would have been quite, would have felt quite comfortable sweeping it under the carpet. I think we have time for one more question. If anyone has one, if not, I will take the prerogative of the chair. No, we've got one here. It's coming to you now. Um, we had a session this morning regarding foreign aid, and I guess my question is that I know a lot of people find this all very evil, what we're doing, but perhaps the explanation is that there's, there's this economic basis, and I guess I'm not, I'm probably calling corruption here, but do you think that there's a link between this high expenditure of aid budget on various things overseas and collusion with governments such as Sri Lanka and I mean we do have these situations like hiring um, ex-Sri Lankan army generals to be managers of our camps and things like that and you just sort of start to wonder is there this sort of economic collusion going on in the background disguised as aid and border protection? I think there's definitely a play when it comes to Cambodia um, and the resettlement. I think you know, whatever the government says that, you know, this is not uh, linked to, to aid, I think from the Cambodian perspective, there, there definitely must be money on the table for them to agree to accept hundreds of people to their country. There would be no other reason that they would, would do so. I mean, I think when it comes to Sri Lanka and things, yeah, it, be, it becomes a lot murkier, but I think we've decided that we're going to pump the money into detention camps and into people smuggling ventures and patrol boats. Um, but we're not looking at pumping that money really into the measures that could actually protect the rights of people. And I think that's what's really dangerous. I mean, look, I don't know, I think I would probably have some less problems with our solution if Australia also said, well, you know what, we're actually going to lift the amount of refugees that we accept every year to 100,000. But that hasn't happened. And so, you know, at the end of the day, the fact that, you know, we're still accepting a very minute proportion of you know, the world's uh, displaced population. And you know, in the meantime, just you know, shoving people off to, to other countries is, is just really not acceptable.